Evangelist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Jennifer Innes, and I am happy to serve as the minister along with the members and friends of this congregation. This is a welcoming congregation, and we are always learning how to be better at our welcome and how to better build our beloved congregation. And we do that in part by fulfilling our mission of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing spiritually, and healing our world. As part of our mission, we recognize those who have gone before us. In the spirit, we recognize the Peoria people who created their world here and cherish the earth around us. If you are new to this congregation, I invite you to help us get to know you. At the end of the service, there will be a link for our Zoom uh, coffee hour, and all are invited to this conversation. Please also send a note to the church office if you'd like more information. For the special announcement today, I call your attention to the renewal of our covenant circles. These small groups meet a couple of times per month at a range of days and times. They are led by dedicated members of this congregation. And every September is a chance to renew these circles. This is a great time to join a group and get connected and get to know some of the members of the congregation. For today and the rest of September, we have messages from uh, members of these covenant circles. And for this week, we get to hear from Jessica Spellman. Hello, I'm Jessica and this is Baby Nora. Um, covenant circles have been a great way for me to meet people in the church since I'm new to the area and have been a great source of support as we navigate everything going on with COVID and for me navigating new motherhood. Thank you, Jessica. You are also welcome to contact Joyce Rosenberger, who coordinates our Covenant Circles, and you may contact the office. We hope you will become part of these wonderful small groups. And now, let us enter into our worship. From Marge Kipe, as surely as we belong to the universe, we belong together. We join here to transcend the isolated self, to reconnect, to know ourselves, to be at home, here on earth, under the stars, linked with each other. Lashana Tova Tikatevu, may you be inscribed for a good year in the book of life. 
This weekend marks the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, the two days celebrated at the start of the new year in the Jewish tradition. The Book of Life is opened by Yahweh, or God, and the names of the righteous are inscribed for the coming year. There is a window of 10 days until Yom Kippur, when people might address wrongs, seek forgiveness, and show repentance for how they have harmed others. So this New Year's Day is a time for reflection and indeed is a solemn experience. At the same time, the days of awe are for celebration, for the wonder and gift of life whose sweetness is to be enjoyed. Thus, we have apples and honey on our table today. The gifts of life include the bounty of compassion found in the holy and shared among all. Now, Judaism is one of many sources of inspiration, revelation, and tradition in Unitarian Universalism. The recognition of these high holy days is part of our ongoing search for truth and meaning, and how this tradition informs the ways that we explore forgiveness and refreshing our spirits for the new year. So let us lift up the spirit of Rosh Hashanah and honor it in solidarity with all of Judaism. Lashana Tova Tigatevu. May you be inscribed for a good year in the Book of Life. It is the Jewish tradition to light candles, to bring light into the world, to give form to the spark of life in all things. And we do this in our chalice lighting. Thank you to Jean and Adam Sloan for offering our chalice lighting today. From Unitarian Universalist Ministers, Charles Howe and Napoleon Lovely, we light this chalice to affirm that new light is ever waiting to break through to enlighten our ways, that new truth is ever waiting to break through to illumine our minds, and that new love is ever waiting to break through to warm our hearts. May we be open to this light and to the rich possibilities that it brings us. The next message is a gift from my Unitarian Universalist colleague, the Reverend Joanna Lubkin. I invite you to listen and reflect. In honor of the Jewish High Holy Days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I share these words from Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz. There are things that are important to us, and so we speak about them. There are things that are very important to us, and so words flow out from us, bursting with emotion, meaning, and depth. And then there are things that shake us to the core. The core of our being does not wait for the mind's permission or for the right words. There are no words that can contain it. It breaks out in a cry, in a scream, and in silence. This is the sound of the shofar, which Jewish communities blow at Rosh Hashanah and at the close of Yom Kippur services. It is a crying voice not even of a human being, but of an animal's horn. We need the animal, not for its coarseness, but on the contrary, because we need to express something so sublime, it cannot find words, so essential and unbounded, the mind can neither fathom it nor hold it back. Each group of sounds from the shofar begins with a tekiya, a whole note proceeds to shivarim, a broken note divided into three parts, and even to a teruah, an entirely fragmented sound. But each broken note is followed by a whole note, another tekiah. This is the message of Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz concludes. I started off whole I became broken, even splintered into fragments, but I shall become whole again. I shall become whole again. So may it be for us, and so may it be for our world. 
You're welcome to join me in saying the blessing for blowing the shofar or hearing its sound, the text of which will appear on your screen, first in Hebrew and then in English. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu Lishmoa Kol Shofar Blessed are you, source of all, who has blessed us with the ritual of hearing the sound of the shofar. Shana Tova, wishing you a sweet and healthy new year. Good morning. This morning I want to share a story about mistakes. I am 100% sure that there's not a person watching here this morning that has never made a mistake. And that's perfectly okay. It wouldn't be human not to. It's what you do after a mistake that counts. Our story today is called The Watermelon Thieves by Nicole Giles. It's hot! Joey complained to his little brother, Lauren. Yesterday, a heat wave had blasted through town, and now they were trying to play marbles. But Joseph was so sweaty that his shooter marble slipped from his fingers. Let's go for a swim, Joey said. As the boys walked toward the river, they saw Sam and Frank, who ran to join them. Swimming's just what we need to cool off, Sam said, kicking a rock. Sure is, Frank agreed. Too bad we don't have a sweet treat to take with us. Then Frank looked at the field they were passing. The afternoon sun blazed off the smooth round watermelons in Farmer Davis's patch. Hey Joseph, Frank said, I dare you to climb over that fence and get us a ripe watermelon. I don't know, Joseph said, isn't that stealing? Come on, Frank said, pushing Joseph toward the fence. No one will ever know. What's the matter? Are you chicken? No, Joseph said, squirming. Frank started to climb the wooden fence rails. Come on, don't be a baby. I'll go with you. Don't worry. We'll just take a little one. No one will ever miss it. Joseph grabbed the closest melon and raced to the fence. The other boys laughed and took turns carrying the heavy melon as they ran to the river. Finally, they broke open the watermelon and the sticky sweet juice that trickled down their chins was delicious. But Joseph already wished he hadn't taken the melon. On the walk home, they finished off the last of the melon just as they passed the watermelon patch again. Joseph ducked when he saw Farmer Davis in the field. Farmer Davis frowned, took off his hat, and scratched his head as the boys passed by. Joseph felt terrible. It had been wrong to take the watermelon. He knew he had to tell Farmer Davis what they'd done and ask for his forgiveness. That evening, Farmer Davis visited Joseph and Lauren at their house. One of my prize watermelons went missing. I was wondering if you boys happened to see anyone in my field as you passed by today. Joseph looked at his shoes, a knot tightening in his stomach. Yes, sir, he said quietly. We were with some other boys and I took a melon from your field. We took it to the river and all of us ate it together. Farmer Davis pressed his lips into a straight line. Taking a melon that you didn't grow was stealing. I'm really sorry, Joseph said. I don't have any money, but I could do some chores to repay you. I ate some too, Lauren said. I'll help. Farmer Davis thought for a moment. Tomorrow morning, when you're finished with your chores at home, come to my field 
and I think I can find some work for you. That night, Joseph lay in bed and felt better. He felt good inside to be able to make up for his mistake. The knot in Joseph's stomach loosened. Tomorrow morning, he would go to the Davises' farm and do whatever chores the farmer asked him to do. And he wouldn't complain about the extra work or the heat at all. Just like Joseph, we all make mistakes. And so, just like Joseph, may we all have the courage to apologize for our mistakes, learn from them, and work to make up for them as best we can. So be it. The second sacred story is Pocket Full of Rocks. Malcolm Tent was just fine, he was doing okay, till he went to his classroom one dark stormy day, and his teacher, Ms. Crabb, blew her cork, flipped her lid, blaming Malcolm for something someone else did. It just wasn't fair, it just wasn't right, Malcolm said to himself at the bus stop that night. I will not forgive and I will not forget, he promised himself in the cold and the wet. Looking down as the rain soaked his shoe in his sock, he saw something shiny, a rain slickened rock. What a perfect reminder, my best idea yet. This rock will remind me to never forget. But Malcolm soon found one rock wasn't enough. Turns out he was bothered by all kinds of stuff. Malcolm got quite annoyed at the things people do because he didn't remember that he's people too. So finding more pebbles, more stones, and more rocks, he put them in pockets, even down in his socks. If you want to stay grumpy and grouchy all day, a sore foot's the best thing, our Malcolm would say. Trouble with rocks is they're hard and they're bumpy. They make your clothes saggy, they make you look lumpy. But that's not the worst thing that happened to Tint. Inside, he was hardening, just like cement. Till one day, walking in the rain all dejected, he saw himself in a large puddle reflected. His first thought was, wow, what a big lumpy rock. No, wait, that's me, he claimed with a shock. Oh, what am I doing, he heard himself groan. My heart is now nearly as hard as a stone. After thinking all night, Malcolm said, now I see. When I don't forgive others, I hurt only me. So he took all the stones from his pockets and socks, and he built a rock garden with all of those rocks. Then every time someone did him a good deed, Malcolm went to his garden and planted a seed. Now Malcolm grows beautiful veggies and blossoms, and everyone says that his garden looks awesome. He doesn't look lumpy. He smiles a lot too, because he really remembers the good people do. Leave aside the little thoughts that distract you from the depths of your soul, for this is a holy place and now is a holy time. Join with others in this circle, in this community of seekers, and together let us find our hearts made lighter by the sharing of our cares. I want to thank Shara Ricky for putting together our joys and sorrows for this week. We offer healing thoughts to Nancy Phillips, who is currently at OSF St. Francis, recovering from an illness. And we also offer our joys. First, our congratulations to Martha and Bill DeBold as they celebrate the birth of grandson Carter Lee, born on September 3rd to Amanda and Josh. And big sister Caitlin welcomed her brother home. We offer our congratulations to BJ and Terrence Lindsay as they celebrated their 24th wedding anniversary on September 12th. And let us also offer, in our joys and sorrows, let us also offer our prayers and our care to the larger concerns of our world. For the fires in the West, for those who are lost, for those who have lost everything, May the firefighters and the rescue staff take care of themselves as they fulfill their call to care for others and our earth. We offer our care to those who are suffering from COVID-19. May they find the healing they need. And for those who have died, we grieve. For the caretakers and medical professionals, we offer our thanks. And for those struggle, struggling to live now, may they know well, may we know, those of us who are also struggling, that we are not alone. May our leaders choose science and compassion and a higher moral calling 
as they guide our society through these next critical months. Let us take one more moment in silence. We hold before us all the names and the milestones, joys and sorrows that are among us. There is so much on our hearts and in our lives. May this be a space of pause within the embrace of this beloved community. Let us remember that we are not alone in our hardship. And may we offer our love and support for all who are part of this congregation, for those in our lives, and for our larger world. I invite you to be with me in a quiet breath in and out in this moment. We hold before us all the names and milestones, joys and sorrows that are with us and are in silence. Early in the evening on Friday, September 18th, the world received news that a great person had died. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died at the age of 87 due to the complications from pancreatic cancer. She had an amazing life of service as she advocated for human rights in our legal system. She was a remarkable role model for multiple generations of women and girls, really for all of us. And she was, in fact, a cultural icon of fitness and tenacity and wit and honesty. She also was human, with a family who loved her and all of her imperfections. Justice Ginsburg life and death reminds us of the fragility in our systems and in our humanity. Many of us are bereft. Would that she could have had a chance to retire and choose how to spend her final years. She may have continued to serve the court, but it is likely she felt she had to remain to protect the progress made in her lifetime. Many of us grieve her death and are afraid of what her absence means for our justice system and for our society in this election year. In this time of great sorrow, let us be gentle with ourselves and gentle with each other. Seek out those who love you and will be present to you, including members and friends of this congregation. If you need additional support, please reach out to me as well. In Justice Ginsburg Jewish tradition, I understand that when a person dies just before Rosh Hashanah, they are truly blessed and honored by God. May this be so. May she be at peace and may her life be a blessing. For a meditation, we have the poem from Rabbi Jack Reimer on turning. Now is the time for turning. The leaves are beginning to turn from green to red to orange. The birds are beginning to turn and are heading more to the south. The animals are beginning to turn to storing food for the winter. For leaves, birds, and animals, turning comes instinctively. But for us, turning does not come so easily. It takes an act of will for us to make a turn. It means breaking old habits. It means admitting that we have been wrong. And this is never easy. It means losing face. It means starting all over again. And this is always painful. It means saying, I'm sorry. It means recognizing that we have the ability to change these things are hard to do. But unless we turn, we will be trapped forever in yesterday's ways. God of our hearts, spirit of life, help us turn from callousness to sensitivity, from hostility to love, from pettiness to purpose, from envy to contentment, from carelessness to discipline, from fear to faith. Turn us around, O oh God, and bring us back toward you. Revive our lives as at the beginning. And turn us toward each other, God, 
for in isolation there is no life. Amen. Lashana Tova toward a good new year. The seasons have turned yet again. In the Jewish tradition, they celebrated the start of their new year, 5781. Friday night was the beginning of one of the most holy times in Judaism, when people go through a personal inventory of wrongs done by act or word and make every effort for forgiveness as well as making amends. For this year, Rosh Hashanah and the High Holy Days we can consider that as a creation story that happens again and again. And as the story that continually renews, we encounter the power of speaking life into existence. We experience the consequences of choices, of naming, of declaring. For us, in our everyday lives, as we usher in the beginning of the year and speak of renewal in our theme this month, what does, what does starting over in the new year look like today? What does it mean to begin again with a deep beginning in these unprecedented, unprecedented times? What does starting over in the new year look like today? And what does it mean to begin in these unprecedented times? Now, when working within such a practice as writing one's name on the Book of Life itself, which is the metaphor for these days in Judaism, I think we should begin with the really big picture, something cosmic, if you will. Uh, Rabbi David Seidenberg, who is the author of Kabbalah and Ecology, God's Image in the More Than Human World, he wrote a beautiful reflection in this time with regard to how we treat the earth and how we keep making choices. He invokes the sense of deep time that comes with Rosh Hashanah. He says, on Rosh Hashanah, after every time we hear the sound of the shofar, we call out the words, 
Hayom Harat Olam. Hayom Harat Olam. This expression is usually translated as today is the birthday of the world or today the world is born. But even though, he says, that's a common translation, the Hebrew word hara or harat actually means pregnancy, conception, or gestation. It's not birth, but the process that leads to birth. Let me say again, it's not birth, but it's the process that leads to birth. And furthermore, olam, he says, can mean world, but it can also mean eternity. For the root word of hidden, or more precisely, the infinite that is hidden, is beyond our limited perception. Therefore, the expression, he says, of harat olam could be rendered as pregnant with eternity or eternally pregnant. So the days of Rosh Hashanah are pregnant with eternity. And I say again, in this time, in this moment, during Rosh Hashanah, this very moment we are in is pregnant with eternity. To say, what deeper evocation could one find of this wondrous and miraculous cosmos than to say it is eternally pregnant, always bringing forth new life, new creatures, new species? Our universe is always dynamic and growing. It's not balanced like a pillar on a foundation, but it is more like a gyroscope, David says, turning and turning. What higher praise, he says, of the Creator could there be than when one finds in this description, and as it says in the Psalms, how wondrously diverse, how limitless, how great are your works, source of life. All of this is in our cosmic moment of Rosh Hashanah and in the sound of the shofar that is whole and broken and whole again and again and again. Now, as creatures, in this corner of the galaxy, we have our part. We ourselves are actors in the universe, if you will, in creation. We have been for a long time in this place. In keeping with Jewish tradition that we are exploring today, now a long time, uh, metaphorically in our deep stories, would bring us back to the garden in the Bible and those first humans, Adam and Eve. In the line of human decision-making, we have a lot in common from Adam and Eve, who made a first choice about the care of the Garden of Eden. They also made their choice to eat from the tree of the fruit uh, of knowledge of good and evil. But let me be clear, their choice, this eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, when God told them not to, that's so often been declared as a sin, but it was not actually a sin. In the Jewish tradition, that act of eating the fruit was under, is understood as a choice. It's a choice with consequences, but it's a choice, not sin. Adam and Eve chose what to do about engaging with their world. As my Unitarian Versalist and Jewish colleague, the Reverend Marty Keller points out, their choice gained them a sense of power and not leaving everything up to God. So we are in that, in essence, that lineage from Adam of Eve of taking our power and not leaving everything up to outside forces. So in this renewal for this year, how shall we renew our sense of engagement, of agency in the world? We get to have this challenge in these days of awe, of coming back to this practice of reflection, of admission to what we have done, and a commitment to reform and change our lives. In the practice of the spiritual work of Rosh Hashanah, another year has passed, and here we are again. And in this moment, we have so much to consider. We have the fires in the West, we have storms in the Atlantic, we have a pandemic, and we also have, among other things, this awareness of racial oppression and conflict 
around shifting those systems that have been around for, that we have created for a very, very long time. So we have all of this and more in our world right now. And as individuals, as a community, as a society, in dealing with these before us, our executive functions are challenged already. And now, now in, in this time of this new year in Judaism, we are being asked to consider the world and the universe, to consider everything we have done that you or I have done wrong or handled badly, all of those concerns in our lives. Isn't there enough before we are asked to engage with this practice as well? What we have as an opportunity is, and what, one of the reasons I come back to the High Holy Days again and again and keep trying to understand it as a Unitarian Universalist looking into Judaism, is how much this renewal of the world calls us back into relationship. The start of a new year, if you will, is not worth much unless our actions make it different from the year before. I'm reminded every time I engage with this tradition and this practice that it is worth reckoning with our lives right now and not putting it off, not waiting to a better time or another moment. And it is so restorative to listen to the, think about the sound of the shofar, of what sounds, what was whole and is broken and then has a chance to be whole again. To have faith in that there are renewals and cycles that are a part of our lives and that they don't just go away because we are heartbroken or traumatized or deeply concerned or don't see the path right now. Part of what we get to do in this moment of personal reckoning that is the core of the spiritual practice in Rosh Hashanah is addressing the wrongs that we have done. Uh, and I realize, I'm gonna put a couple of other religious words out here, and I'm gonna give you a little fair warning. I realize the word sin has some very negative reactions among us. I'm gonna ask you to hang in there. We are both drawing from Judaism and understanding the tradition in its context. So I wanna offer an understanding of sin as missing the mark. It's not something that you're inherently bad about, but you have aspirations, values, uh, purposes in our lives, and that there are times when we kind of don't aim true, if you will. So I want to ask, in this last year, in this moment, when have you gone astray from what matters most, from your higher values? our larger relationships and commitments. So if you will, sin is when we move away from those transcendent values of love and hope and justice. When we get off track from, uh, the, say, the church's mission of loving inclusively and making the effort to heal our world. So if you understand that's where sin is maybe coming from, when the liturgy is put together for these days in the tradition, there's a litany of confession for harms done, whether or uh, by intent or not, and it can be extensive uh, to consider all the harms that one may, have, one may have committed in the course of a year. From Chaim Stern, a reform rabbi from the 20th century, who's known for his poetry and creation of liturgy, I offer his prayer for overcoming indifference. For the sin of silence, for the sin of indifference, for the secret complicity of the neutral, for the closing of borders, for the washing of hands, for the crime of indifference, for the sin of silence, 
for the closing of borders, for all that was done and all that was not done. Let there be no forgetfulness before the throne of glory. Let there be remembrance within the human heart and let there at last be forgiveness when your children, O God, are free and at peace. In the Jewish tradition, there is this effort of confession to be witnessed and affirmed by God. But I'm going to say at the same time, this act of confession, this naming out loud, is very much a human endeavor as well. It gets to take us, take into our heart, and honoring and naming and owning what we have done and what we have not done. You could take responsibility. We consider all that has happened uh, for ourselves as well as in our society, the war and climate change and poverty and systems of oppression. We make this effort to engage, to find our way to refresh and renew and confess and own our mistakes again and again. And I want to offer, we don't have to do this alone. We do this because of love, because of the value of connection. And in doing this together, we get to do this in church. I see um, how we get to help each other uh, in figuring out how to stay on track and how to uh, understand the value of, of engaging in this work of ownership and forgiveness not by ourselves, but with others. We get to be reminded about what's most important in this work, what's most important in our coming together. I'm reminded of this often in particular with religious education programs for, uh, in particular, how in every volunteer conversation somewhere, in talking with volunteers working with children and with youth, somewhere there is this reminder of our larger purpose like why adults would mentor youth, why youth would spend a time with adults outside of our immediate families. We find kindred souls for games and for laughter. We expand the circle of relationship that holds us through uh, times of struggle and times of joy. We get to help a teen figure out what pronouns to use and who they love. Um, we get to kick off the start of the religious education year as as Amy Pop and the, and the Religious Education Program are doing this afternoon with a uh, communion of chocolate and fruit. And we get to kind of have that play, that sacred play together. All of this coming together helps make it easier to go back to recognizing how we have gotten off track and how important it is to find our way back again. We have the particular opportunity of the religious community so we don't face the new year alone, to have companions when our heart is too full and needs a chance to be emptied. So we have practice with renewing our acts of creation, if you will. Knowledge of good and evil doesn't mean we know what to do with our world, not at first and not in many moments along the way. So we work together to make that possible. And part of our work in the Jewish tradition is really understanding um, how we own our errors and mistakes and how we can feel truly sorry and make every effort to right whatever wrong has been done. Uh, in Judaism, this practice is called teshuva. And we see this found in the story of the watermelon thieves that Amy told earlier. Now, teshuva is usually, tr usually translated as repentance, and it really means return. Uh, when we fall short of being our best selves, we are haunted by our conscience, as the watermelon thieves were in the story. And we go through the process of teshuva to help us to erase our mistakes and return to our more moral center. We admit what we've done wrong. We feel remorse, resolve in our heart not to do that again, and make every effort to right the wrong, including apologizing and acting for asking for forgiveness 
and making every effort to relieve the pain or distress we might have caused. So that act of admission, the feeling of remorse, resolving to change and owning the error and every, doing everything we can to make it right, that is that deep internal process and then taking it out into the world in action, that is the process of teshuva. We also have uh, in our act of going through, you know, going through this new year process together, um, we get to witness others, mutual support, what different behavior might look like. Um, this clearing of the heart uh, also applies to resentment. Uh, in the story of Pocket Full of Stones, Malcolm uh, is becoming entirely different because of what he's holding on to. And he finally realizes that when he sees his lumpy reflection in a puddle. I like the story because it offers kind of the other side of this process of reckoning. Um, how often uh, I know, I don't know what a, whether another person understands the impact of their actions on me. I have to make choices about how to proceed as well. Now, Malcolm made the choice at first to hold on to rocks, but there's a different process that can be found, one that's a cycle of forgiveness and learning. It's not forgetting, it's not erasing something that happened, but it is forgiving and releasing what had been in the past whenever possible. This process can be one where we treat ourselves gently uh, in times of deep trauma, of some harms, because some harms last and last and aren't resolved in one moment of reckoning. It is forgiveness as much as possible, so we may move forward. This is the work of faith and community as well. Um, and we remind each other as we gather, as we weep together and struggle together, that there is going to be another day, that the sun will rise again. Now, Malcolm removed his stones himself and power to him because the work we have to start with ourselves. But I tell you, and I bet, uh, I will admit, I don't do well at releasing resentment and grudges on my own. The communal spirit of these next days in the Jewish tradition is a further reminder of how we support each other even though each of us is responsible for crafting our own page in the Book of Life. So, in this moment, in this gathering of these days of awe, how do we begin? We offer an honest assessment of ourselves. We ask for help. We admit mistakes and seek forgiveness. We can let ourselves be willing to mend what has been broken. And if we can do this again and again, we are clearing ourselves that we may be ready for what may come, for continuing this work of justice, for this effort, our commitment to compassion and recognizing the holy in each other, for understanding that we are all in this together, that we are all part of this great and wondrous world, to be able to reckon and move forward is never more important than right now in this very moment. Hayom Harat Olam. Today, this day, this Rosh Hashanah is pregnant with eternity. Today is an opportunity to conceive new intentions, new possibilities. Today is our day. Today is when we are on this very planet Earth. And as we say at the end of the Rosh Hashanah liturgy, Hayim Kulchem Hayom, all of you are alive today. And today, Hayom, our choices will gestate for the future, for our children and for the children of every species upon this planet. Today, may we find courage. Today, may we be blessed. Today, may we be inscribed in the book of life for good lives. Today, let us listen to the voice of guidance within us. Today, let us pay attention to the creation that is around us. All of this 
All of this is potent and possible and happening. May you go forth into this good day. Amen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And from my colleague, Amy Zucker Morgenstern, the book of life is open before us. It tells stories of sadness and happiness, despair and hope, stagnation and change, and a peaceful stillness that transcends all. May you be written in the book of life. May you write your own name there in the shining ink stirred together from tears of the past, the sweet flower essence of the hoped for future. May you know who you have been and who you are and bless your future self with loving, brave intention. Lashana Tova, toward a good new year. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>